Welcome to the Clarity Advisor Show, where you'll learn how to grow your team today. Join Ken Trubke and his guests as they discuss what works and doesn't work to grow your team in today's world. And now, your host, Ken Trubke. Hello, and welcome to the Clarity Advisor Show. As leaders, we're continually teaching and coaching our teams. And my guest today, as a top executive, has done that for years and now is doing that in the classroom. Tom Olive has been a top executive at a nutrition products company, an automotive textile manufacturing company, and most recently at a large fuel distributor. So Tom's background is in accounting and finance, and he's learned to use numbers to help align and engage his teams to drive business growth and success. So welcome to the show, Tom Olive. Thank you, Ken. It's great to be here and congratulations. Yeah, Tom, I really appreciate that. So I want to get to the, uh, your experience as a CEO, but first talk to me about uh, what you're doing in the classroom now. You're teaching literally. So t- talk about that a little bit. Yeah, just uh, two courses today. So after four years as an adjunct instructor and, and trying this out, uh, I retired from, um, from the executive ranks at Crystal Flash at the end of May and have joined the faculty here at Aquinas College, teaching finance-oriented courses in the business department. So I'm really enjoying getting the school year started this week. That's great. And, and it's not so much of a pivot because like I said in the opening, we were always teaching and coaching as leaders, but what prompted you to literally go back to the classroom? Yeah, my mother was a lifelong teacher and obviously very formative in in my whole being and experience there. So then you fast forward into my, I was about 29, 30 years old. I applied to a couple of PhD programs and was accepted and went through the discernment process with my wife only to find out that we wanted to uh, pursue a corporate uh, corporate career and, and stayed that direction. And so really just over, as I said, the last four years have come back to this. Um, so I guess I kind of call it a knee-jerk decision 30 years in the making here. Okay, very good. So, well, now take us back. You've got a ton of experience and you bring a lot of value to this conversation. So take us back and walk us through some of the roles and responsibilities that you've had over the years. I introduced myself to my students as a reformed accountant. I, my undergraduate degree was in accounting. I started in public accounting. And after about three months, came home to my new bride and said, honey, this ain't going to be uh, this ain't, ain't going to be where it's all at for me. So I uh, returned to graduate school at the Kellogg School at Northwestern University and had the privilege of joining the Procter and Gamble Company in their finance development program, where I spent eight years in about six different assignments, uh, learning in depth financial analysis and strategy and business support. Uh, I then joined the Campbell Soup Company and was very quickly after six weeks put on an airplane and spent six months commuting between the Philadelphia suburban area and Sydney, Australia, where uh, my family then relocated for two and a half years on an expat assignment with the Arnott's group, again, as a finance uh, director in in that business. After returning to the States in a a year in the red and white soup business, I had become a bit disillusioned with the Fortune 50, Fortune 250, a large company um, for me, uh, a gerbil wheel. And so I went uh, down market into lower middle market companies and explored this thing called private equity and joined a company backed by KKR. Uh, That led through a merger and acquisition back into a small publicly traded company. And then 20 years ago, we moved here to West Michigan where I was the CFO of a portfolio company of Sun Capital Partners. That was Elon Nutrition, the, the contract developer and manufacturer of nutrition bars graduated into the president and CEO role there. We sold that business as uh, was the objective of being backed by private equity sponsors. And lo and behold, Sun Capital had another portfolio company based here in West Michigan that I was able to join, True Textiles, served as the president and CEO for five years, uh, nearly five years there, where we were able to find a, a strategic buyer and sell that business. And for the last eight years of my career, I was served in the uh, president CEO role at Crystal Flash, the fuel distribution company here in the state of Michigan, uh, and had the privilege of leading that business from fam- 80 plus years of family ownership to an ESOP, a new experience for me, 100% own- employee ownership, and really had fun working with the employees and transitioning to, to be a f- uh, self-sufficient freestanding business. And uh, we enjoyed some fantastic success together. 
Yeah, that is, that's a lot of not only uh, levels of experience and variety of experience, but geography. I, I did not realize that you spent years in Australia. I knew you'd been around the country a little bit, but I didn't know you were out of the country for that period. So uh, that's, that's really interesting. So, of course, in the course of those assignments, you have made any number, as we all have, any number of mistakes as a leader. So if you could share some of those that we might learn from, uh, what are some things that maybe you didn't do so well? Yeah, th th that's always the great question, Ken, because we learn more from, from those failures than we do from successes. And so I'm going to kind of um, answer that a little bit, maybe sideways here, but bring it back. I, I've really come to appreciate that you need to have the right horse for the right course. And both Elon and Nutrition and True Textiles were portfolio cap companies of Sun Capital Partners, a private equity firm focused on turnarounds and transformations. And so my financial and analytical background was a really, really good fit for those businesses and to be able then to lead them to, uh, to a degree of success uh, that we were able to enjoy as, as a team. On the flip side, while I was with Sun, one of the uh, principals there said to me, you, know, you, could, you could probably lead any number of companies in our portfolio, but there's a lot of them I'm not going to put you in. We're not going to put you in an engineering uh, company or a bio a life sciences or something like that. And, and that was uh, really a, a, a kind of a real good reminder of that, uh, this very idea that, that some folks are suited for uh, some businesses very, very well. I take that fast forward just to my most recent experience. Uh, we had a leadership transition at Crystal Flash. We just brought in a new uh, CEO to, to follow me. An entirely different individual, but absolutely the right individual. A couple of years ago, I was able to step back, look at the direction that, that Crystal Flash was headed, what it needed, and said, you know, this has been a lot of fun. I'm enjoying it. I got this teaching thing I'd like to go do. I think it would be a good idea if we've got someone with a different set of skills. And we were blessed to be able to find uh, a new leader that is absolutely the right fit for this next leg of strategic journey. So to kind of come back to your question, I think a lot of it has to do with fit and has to do with fit of the leader, fit of the team members, and, and making sure that you've got alignment with the challenges that are in front of us and with the uh, skill sets that are required to lead the team forward into those challenges. Yeah, and, and I want to dive in a little bit to that role. I think it's so interesting, the world of private equity, where, where companies like KKR, which is one of the, the bigger players, uh, buy companies, and then a lot of times will change out the management. And, and it's their plan to own that company for X number of years, sometimes five, sometimes 10. Some are buy and hold, but for the most part, they're buying it for a season and they plan to sell it. And so they're going to bring in a seasoned leader like you. These aren't businesses that you started or that you built. You're getting parachuted in there to lead these businesses for a season and grow it to a point so that it can be sold. So talk a little bit about wh what you do when you go into those companies. How do you connect with the team and lay out your role and get them to come along with you on this journey where you're the new guy and you're only going to be there for a while? Yeah, yeah. And as, as uh, you can say, this next part will kind of sound like it's out of the textbook. And it's like, okay, well, there's the, the, the teacher uh, reading the textbook. But I say it because it's worked. And it's a playbook that I've uh, seen applied and reapplied myself a couple of times with, with a degree of success, Ken. I think absolutely the first thing you have to do as a leader is to establish clarity about the vision and mission. And I use those two words together. I think they, they get flip-flopped around a little bit. But what do you want the company to be or what do you want the organization to be when it grows up or when it grows through as you said this next season or this next stage of its strategic journey and be real clear on that and be able to articulate what that looks like secondly is you need to develop a three to five year plan i tend to think in three to five years some folks like to think longer than that um i, I think the world's pretty dynamic these days and so uh, trying to envision much further out than that. I, I personally struggle with that. But at Crystal Flash, we were a logistics and distribution company, a trucking company. And so we called it our roadmap. And we laid out where do we want to be with the customer? Where do we want to be with our processes um, and, and our um, uh, internal systems? Where do we want to be organizationally and with our culture five years from now? And then the third step is what are the mile markers? What are the action plans, the activities that we need to do 
and start to look at what are the prerequisites, what, what follows what, what, what are uh, sequential uh, kinds of things, what can we do concurrently, put that all down on a piece of paper or on a spreadsheet or whatever uh, medium we wish to use, and then start to look at our ability to actually do that. Uh, do we have the capacity financially? Do we have the capability organizationally? And once we get a, a, a bit of a feel and an idea for that, we've got our vision and mission, we've got our long-term strategic plan and goal point, we have our mile markers or intermediate steps in terms of initiatives or uh, process changes and things we need to do. Now we're ready to start to build that budget. Where are we going next year? And laying out those details in terms of our uh, what, we, what we want to do in our sales and our revenue and our cost structure and interacting with our customers. And it's like, phew, we got that all done. But we've only generally just started because we need to take that to the next step. And what I've, uh, you know, tools we've used is figuring out what is our scorecard? What's that balanced scorecard? What are our KPIs? And not just the numerical ones, but more the qualitative ones, or not just the monthly financial metrics, but what do we want for customer growth? What do we want for our customer engagement scores? How do we uh, rate our internal culture and score that? And start to put all the, those that scoring together and then consistently tracking against that scorecard. And then finally, we have all these wonderful things we've documented, probably work together on that as an executive team. We've got to make sure that we communicate these pieces and that we're out there talking with our team members so that they understand the vision and mission and where are we going out there in three to five years? What's right in front of us next year? And, and what are our objectives? What are we focusing on? And what's the score? How do we set up our scorecard? Who do we communicate that to? How frequently do we, are we going to communicate that as a leadership team? And so we make sure that folks know what's the game we're playing, what, what quarter are we in, how much time's left on the clock, what's the score, and, and what are our expectations for what kind of plays we're going to be calling it at, at this point in the game so that we can have a real good opportunity to hit all of our initiatives, our mile markers for this coming year. I want to dive into some more conversations around what you've learned as a leader and some of the things you, that your teams did and how you succeeded. And we'll do that on the other side of the break. Stay with us on the Clarity Advisor Show. Is your business where you want it to be or on track to get there? Clarity Advisors helps business leaders improve communication and get your team aligned and engaged for greater success. We specialize in helping you streamline your sales and operating systems to improve efficiency and grow your profits. Call or text Ken at 616-822-2998 to have a complimentary 12-minute call to see what some clarity could do for you. Okay, welcome back to the Clarity Advisor Show. Today we're talking to former executive and now teacher, Tom Olive. And Tom, you walked us through a really nice framework for how to come into a company and start establishing what we're going to do for the next X, probably three to five years. So, and that's the mechanical side of that. How did you connect with people more emotionally and just that person to person? We talked a little bit about communication, but how do you, how do you connect with people so that they really buy in emotionally and come along with you? That's truly important, Ken, and thank you for uh, coming back to that. And at Crystal Flash, at True Textiles, um, even at Alon Nutrition, we were very intentional about the kind of culture that we wanted to build. And so uh, there are some tools out there, and uh, I've used uh, some pieces and parts out of the Harvard Business Review and some of the literature there. But particularly at, at Crystal Flash, we were very intentional in defining that we wanted to be a results-oriented, continual learning organization. And we talked to the organization about that, is we want to be focused on getting results, and we also want to be continually learning and growing individually, as teams, as a total uh, company, as, as a whole. To support that, we developed what we called CF University, which was an online modular uh, learning system that we were able to push out technical training as well as a lot of company communications, did a lot of recordings like this and, and being able to talk to, um, you know, 320, 325 people distributed across a couple of different states and all across the, the mitten of Michigan. Um, 
And all of that was, again, with intentionality of what kind of culture do we want to be? How do we want to live into this culture? What are our values? How do we constantly talk about those value statements and, and what they mean and how we bring them to life? Uh, and even our weekly newsletter was would be built around the, those, those kind of key themes. So yes, it's very much taking and using those mechanics, the analytical side, but then being very clear about the softer side, the people side, the culture side, who do you want to be? Um, what kind of folks do you want to be? What kind of an organization do you want to be? How do you want to serve your customers? And, and defining that equally well and talking about that continuously to encourage folks to move in that direction. And, and unfortunately, sometimes some team members don't find that to be a fit for them. So back to this idea of the right, you know, the right horses on the right courses, that gives folks an opportunity to opt out if this isn't going to be the type of environment or the type of direction that they want to go. And, you know, we didn't have a lot of that. We had a few folks and we tried to be very supportive and help them get on to a place where they would be more comfortable. But it's important that when you have those folks that don't want to be there or don't want to be a part of that culture that you're intentionally building, they do need to move on and find their, uh, you know, find their next bus to get on in the right seat on that next bus. They need to get off your bus. Yeah, absolutely. And those can be challenging conversations, but I found when you're clear about what you're all about and what we're trying to do here and you communicate that well, that people just self-select. People see this isn't for me. And it, it's still a difficult conversation, but can it be a little bit more mutually, uh, you know, people are going to buy in a little bit because they, they get it from their side too. This isn't just one-sided you kind of telling them how it is. You're both seeing it. So, but yeah, it's, it's still challenging and, and laying that out so that it is clear is a challenging part as well. So, well, Tom, your career has spanned literally decades and some things have changed. What, what have you seen in terms of what teams need and what leaders need to do to connect with their teams today? What, what are some things that are different today? Yeah, I think, um, Right from the get go and from that recruiting process, both at True and, and at Crystal Flash, I, I did um, have the opportunity to make significant changes in the senior leadership positions and having the clarity on that vision and mission, being able to lay out um, a, a five year strategic plan, that roadmap. It gave folks some really talented folks an opportunity to, to again, get on, get in our truck, to get on our bus. Um, and, and then we could get them in the right seats so that they could lead us forward. Uh, at Crystal Flash, we had a little secret sauce on the front line. We were an ESOP. We are an ESOP, 100% employee-owned company. And after a couple of years, as, as team members started to see their retirement balances growing, they saw that there really were these cool economic benefits that came along with living the culture and performing against the, the uh, plans that we have in place for the business. And so that really became... Um, I think synergistic or symbiotic that we were able to show folks very visibly when we do these things culturally, when we do these action plans that we've laid out and execute these strategies, there is a benefit and that benefit accrues to you. Now, you don't have to be an ESOP for that to necessarily happen, but boy, it sure was a, as I said, it was a secret sauce and a nice advantage for us to have. Yeah. And you touched on recruiting there. Uh, recruiting and retaining talent is such a hot topic today. What are some things that you did that work that you believe still work? Um, certainly from the, uh, what I'll call the, the um, senior level and, and, and the managerial level, um, it, it was a lot of things that I've done for 20 years. We, we used recruiters. We were very clear about our, our role descriptions and our expectations. And uh, we, we went and found folks that were currently employed and doing good work in, in, in their current setting. Maybe weren't necessarily thinking about making a move. And then we had to go sell our story. I had to go sell the story of where we wanted to go and how they would fit in and, and be a part of that. Um, on the frontline basis, uh, the trucking industry is very, very cyclical, and you'll go through times when uh, we have lots of applicants and lots of ability to fill our positions, and other times when when the cupboard just was was fairly was fairly barren. But what we would do consistently through all of that is take a multi-channel, kind of an omni-channel approach. We would be online. You know, it's it's amazing folks that are are driving professionally and for a living. 
they're stopping in various places and they're on their phones just like all of us are. They're looking at uh, Indeed and, and they're looking at um, you know LinkedIn or, or um, uh, Instagram and, and we'd be, we would advertise in, in those spaces. We were uh, very uh, dedicated to taking a lot of our process online. Of course, that was accelerated for all of us through the pandemic. Um, but but we tried to make it as simple as possible. So we might have a, because we were servicing Illinois, uh, Indiana, we had drivers all throughout the state of Michigan. And so, uh, you know, scheduling them and saying they had to come into Grand Rapids and spend a day with us wasn't going to fit into their schedule. And so we were, we were very flexible in, in what we did there. And probably I'd say finally, and not a new idea, but one that was probably the best idea and it relates back to the ESOP is our team members were our best recruiters their friends, potentially family members, uh, certainly other drivers that they knew in the in the industry, when they could tell the story and they could sell the vision and they could sell the concept of uh, employee ownership and the benefits that were accruing to them, both from a participative culture and environment, as well as the economic benefits, um, those all became really great selling points. And we got some of our best new teammates were, were recruited by our existing team members. Yeah. Now you've led Tom at the at the highest levels. You've been the CEO of a number of companies. So you've got responsibility for your executive team and then ultimately the entire team. So what's your best advice and maybe what you're sharing in the classroom now for leaders that want to grow and build a team today given the perspective you have of decades of leading at the highest levels? Well, and Ken, you didn't mention it, but we uh, we both are fathers and fathers of a number of children, and they're in that uh, you know uh, late teens to uh, early thirties kind of time range. And uh, my wife and I are constantly uh, uh, walking the dogs and chuckling about how different our children's experiences are, our expectations are, our nieces and nephews' expectations are from our own expectations. Um, and and again, you know, there's so sociologists have written a lot about Gen about us boomers and about Gen X, Y, and Z. And uh, I just understand, you know, I was doing some reading in preparation for this. We now have Gen Alpha, which are our uh, young people, preteens and teens that are that are coming up here next. And they've all been shaped by um, the, their, their experiences, by the social environment, by the economic environment in, in which they've grown up. But certainly, yeah, times are different today. Um, we see young people coming in, particularly into professional roles that really want to understand that vision and mission and where are you where's the company going and what are you as a leader going to do for them to help them to build their careers uh, i do see more mobility uh, both uh, you know in my um, family circle as as well as uh, to a degree in, in the folks who uh, we had the privilege of working with at crystal flash uh, where folks young folks are folks at various places and in, in, in their tenure and their careers are not necessarily looking to come in and be in this company, in this role for a lifetime. They're looking to gather the experiences they can. And I think we really have had to all have to take that attitude that training folks up and getting them prepared for their next role, whether that's with us or with somebody else, is the best way we're going to get business results. Because if they want to leave, they're going to leave. So we might as well um, get the best out of those folks while they're with us. And maybe along the way, they'll see the more opportunities and the next opportunity for them, and they'll be around with us for a while longer. So I think that's something that is certainly different uh, from decades ago when you and I were starting out in our careers, Ken, and, uh, and an enduring trend that is probably gonna be with us for a while. But as also I look back on it and I think, I'm sure the folks that when we first started in the workforce, they thought we were a bit impertinent too, or that our ideas were a bit revolutionary. So it's all uh, a growth and development. And as we go forward together. Right. I think that's, that's definitely true. What is different, I think, is that the, the, there is so much more mobility and people are more willing to make those moves. Or I think in other generations, our generation, less willing to make a move, more willing to stay and kind of endure even when it might not be a good fit or whatever. And so embracing that idea of the season, I think works really well. I really like what you said there about helping them get ready for their next role and whether that might be here still or a different company, but let's, let's both just admit you're probably not going to be doing this same thing 
three, five years from now. So let's help you grow into whatever it is you want to do next. And that kind of paradoxically draws them into you and makes them want to stay. He's like, well, look at all the mentoring and growth opportunities I'm getting here. Why would I want to leave? So I think, I think that is an interesting pivot and, and leaders would do well to consider that and keep that top of mind when they're working with their team. Because you not saying they're going to leave, like you said, doesn't change. They're going to leave if they're going to leave. And so let's just get it on the table and deal with it productively. So, well, Tom, this has been great. Uh, as a teacher, I know you're also a learner. So what have you been consuming recently? Books, podcasts, audiobooks, whatever. Yeah. Well, certainly the podcast from Clarity Advisors, of course, Ken. I do really enjoy it. You've had a uh, quite an array of interesting uh, guests on the podcast. So thank you for that. And, uh, you know, present company accepted. Well, you've, you've uh, lowered the average here, but thank you for what you do. I, uh, I'm an avid reader of the Harvard Business Review, uh, the McKinsey uh, Insights or McKinsey Quarterly. And I've really enjoyed uh, over the last year, year and a half, uh, there were three consultants, McKinsey consultants, um, Dewar, Keller, and Mahatra that uh, developed a, a study and a, published a book called CEO Excellence. And I think that short business book, you know, again, it's got to be 250 pages long and uh, in, in uh, 12 point font kind of thing, but it is one of the best tutorials or handbooks for someone coming into the CEO role that, that I've had the ability to grasp onto and, and read. And so I would strongly recommend it for anyone in a senior management level or a mid manager that has aspirations over the long term uh, to, to really grab, grab onto that, dive into it and, and understand from this uh, compendium or this, this assortment of excellent leaders, what it is that has made them excellent CEOs and, and how they create that mosaic view. Yeah, that's terrific. And, and we'll get those books and the Harvard Business Review links in the show notes so people have access to those. So Tom, again, thanks so much for being here. Who should reach out to you and what would be the best way to do that if someone wanted to connect? Yeah, thank you, Ken, for asking. The, the best way is uh, with my new email here at Aquinas College. It is two001 at aquinas.edu. And I would love to hear from uh, electronically of uh, anyone who's interested in the topics we've been talking about today. I continue to learn and grow through those discussions about leadership, about setting of, of uh, those strategic objectives and building out strategic plans. So that's an area of great interest for me. And also while we didn't dive into it um, as much today, uh, anyone interested in the ESOP as a uh, potential exit plan for owners or family and what that looks like or someone in the early stages of working with an ESOP. We learned a lot over the last seven years and I had the privilege of working with some great people and continue to do so. Or another topic that we invested a lot of time is and is fiduciary responsibilities of uh, and, and governance. So board of directors and uh, the governance responsibilities, particularly in a lower middle market company and in an ESOP company. Those are all subjects that fascinate me and I look to continue to learn and grow in each of those areas. Well, that's terrific. I appreciate the, the specificity there of, of topics that might be interesting for people to reach out to you to discuss. So, and we'll get your contact information also in the show notes. And with that, we're wrapped up. Tom, I can't thank you enough for coming out today and having this conversation. It's been really helpful. So much information and to pack the, uh, years and years into a, a few minutes is great. And I know the listeners got a lot out of it. I know I did, took some notes here today too. So thank you again for, for your time today. Thank you, Ken. And really enjoyed it and best wishes. All right. You're welcome, Tom. And with that, we are at the end of another Clarity Advisors show. Thank you so much for joining us and we will see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Clarity Advisors show. Clarity Advisors is a speaking, training, and consulting firm specializing in helping you simplify your sales and operating systems to improve efficiency and grow your profits. Connect with Clarity Advisors today to learn more about how they can help you improve communication and get your team aligned and engaged for greater success.